Hey, I'm Matt and welcome back to Soil Lab. We're gonna switch things up a little bit on you today and get out of the lab and into the lawn as we're wrapping up our growing season here in the Pacific Northwest. So today we're gonna to do a walkthrough with Chris Borgman and just see how he puts the science to work in his home lawn. So Chris, talk to me a little bit about what we've got going on here in your lawn, maybe your fertility strategy, your height of cut, just what do we have going on here? Yeah, I think everything starts, you know, with uh, there's an opportunity these days to, you know, purchase and have access to good seed genetics. I think that's a, a great starting point. You know, new seed genetics offer great color, texture, um, turf density, improved drought tolerance for lower irrigation. Um, and so we use our my soil seed um, here in my lawn, but uh, there's a number of different um, seed manufacturers that provide great genetics these days. So if you have the opportunity to take advantage of some of these, you know, uh, whether it's overseeding or a full new lawn renovation, I, I really recommend, you know, to take advantage of those. Um, genetics only take you so far, obviously. Um, the way you express those genetics and really expose them is really, you know, proper soil fertility. Uh, we really focus on that. Obviously, we use the, the MySoil test to um, guide fertilizer applications, product selection, you know, throughout the season. Gotcha. So when I look at a lawn like this, that's that's this dense, this dark, I have to think that you're you're fertilizing every week or every other week. You're you've got a full foliar program. I mean, we've got a tight height of cut. So. Can you just talk a little bit about your fertilizer philosophy, how often you're fertilizing, and kind of just generally what types of fertilizers you're using? Yeah, in general, you know, I don't have a lot of time to spend in my lawn. I'd love to spend a little more time, but, you know, I have a pretty full, you know, work schedule. I have a family. I have, you know, three kids under the age of 10 years old, so I don't have a ton of time to spend in the lawn. So I really focus, you know, on fertilizer management. My strategy is to really start the season with an organic um, carbon slow release nitrogen source that's kind of my base you know throughout the season and then I come back in um, depending on growth habits mowing frequency color um, I come back in with a 70% slow release nitrogen product that I use throughout the season to kind of you know fine-tune everything but really I let you know the growth the color really determine you know when my applications happen you know, typically I'm only having to apply every four and even six weeks um, just to maintain that color and even growth throughout the season. Great. And that's a full granular program? That is a full granular program. I um, To cover as much area as I have, it would take a lot of work for me to come in, you know, with a, with a foliar application. You could get a little more color pop, pop if you blend it in, you know, the foliar application. But um, yeah, I go full granular um, and again, a, a blend of that synthetic and organic um, fertilizer approach. And that's, that's worked the best for me. Great. And I've adopted really similar practices in my lawn too. You know, we were using these soil tests to drive that. How often are you soil testing? Um, is it annually and what time of the year? Like what's, what's your philosophy? Uh, my philosophy on soil testing is I like to start every spring with a soil test to see where I left off from last fall, uh, my fall application, see where I'm at, and then I use that to guide my fertilizer product ratio, so like the N to P to K ratio um, that I use in my lawn. So I use the test to really guide that. I will come back, you know, in the fall usually, uh, September-ish and see you know how well I've done with my fertilizer throughout the season if the ratios of fertilizer that I've been using are hitting my targets um, so really you know two times a season is, is plenty one time a season in the spring will also give you the the right data or information you know to drive your fertility through that season so you're using that spring application to really kind of set the direction for your NPK uh, and your micros for the season. And then you're choosing to use the fall really to kind of truth that, right? Exactly. And like, how did it work? And so with that September, um, that September test, for example, you might adjust your late fall fertility, your final half of the season based on, on what you learned there. Yeah, so if I still have a lot of nitrogen available in the soil, I may not do my fall lap. Um, I may just do half of the application, but I want to 
essentially going into winter, I want to make sure that um, I have some nutrient in the soil. The plants have taken up that nutrient and had the ability to store some carbohydrates to give them, you know, energy, you know, throughout the winter, but really store those carbohydrates. So in the spring, we can get that early spring, you know, green up, but I don't like to have a ton of nitrogen fertilizer in the soil, you know, through the winter months where I can have some, a lot of loss, you know, through those winter months. And I think it's important too, that some of that product, if you are applying it, you know, late in the fall, that some of that is a coated or slow release or has some inhibitors to keep it from, you know, leaching through the soil. Yeah, I think that's a great point you make. You know, it's something I think about too. I'll run my nitrogen levels just a little lower, kind of at the bottom end of that optimal range coming into the fall, especially with the nitrate in in particular right. um, so that that's not leaching out you know I was looking at soil temperatures today we're right at 47 48 degrees so things are really slowing down right now and that ammonium shouldn't be converting all that rapidly so if we're still a little high in ammonium um, as long as we're lower in nitrate we're gonna gonna minimize those those leaching losses do you have um, your soil test handy uh, maybe yeah. see, see where you're sitting right now yeah no I think everything's worked out pretty well um, pull up my test here so we can see our, our nitrogen is just above the bottom end of the optimal range I'm okay with that like you said mm -hmm. um, color looks good growth is good so I'm okay with that phosphorus is above the optimal range like I said in our area our soils tend to have a good amount of available phosphorus it's available it's releasing so um, I've been seeing that in a lot of the homeowner samples I've been looking at too consistently in our area we're just high in phosphorus mm -hmm. Um, so wrecking products that, that don't contain any. Exactly. So um, you can see my potassium. I'm dead in the middle of the range here right now. I do know that if I don't apply potassium, even though we have a good amount in these soils, it does not release um, in a fashion that matches the uptake demand of this turf grass. So I do have to supplement potassium throughout the season. So you can see, I usually uh, go with a one to one N to K potassium ratio. So like a 20-0-20 fertilizer mm -hmm. um, for my lawn. And that keeps me right in the middle of that range for, for potassium. If I don't apply it, I know that it'll, it'll draw down on the soil. So um, how's your sulfur looking? Sulfur is good. Um, typically I keep sulfur numbers up a little bit. We typically have higher pH in this area of the country. So I tend to um, use more, you know, ammonium sulfate based products. So they always contain some amount of sulfur. Um, my pH usually sitting around, you know, six, eight, it will come up around seven over the, over the summer, but that's because my irrigation water is around eight and a half to nine pH. Um, and you can see in the irrigation as well, uh, my sodium levels are pretty high and that's coming from my irrigation water. So I really have to, you know, balance that, but I don't come in and usually apply elemental sulfur or anything to try and drop it lower because my frequency of fertilizer applications in the program I'm on keep my pH, you know, in the optimal range, you know, even with the high pH of my irrigation water. Gotcha. So just to recap, so your pH is going to fluctuate a little bit throughout the season. You know, it's going to trend up during mid-season when your irrigation's higher. Mm -hmm. You're just using your fertilizer selection, ammonium sulfate, a highly acidifying uh, fertilizer to drive that pH down right. so that you don't have to use an elemental sulfur or something like that. So Chris, clearly things are looking good here. Um, can you talk to me just a little bit more about your mowing height, your mowing frequency, and what you're mowing with? Yeah, so I use a, a ride-on rotary mower. Um, I keep it typically at a mowing height of about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. That works good for this turf variety or this blend that I use. Um, it's not always possible to keep it that low for everybody, depending on, you know, turf type, how, you know, bumpy a lawn might be the time of year, but that's the kind of height that I settle in on. Um, you know, typically um, during, the, during the season, I'm mowing every two to three days is about my mowing frequency. So I'm trying to match my growth patterns, you know, with that, if it starts to um, you know, be four or five, you know, days. And I know that I need to probably come in with a, a little bit of a spoon feed of, mm -hmm. of fertilizer, but typically every two to three days, I like to mow. Um, 
what that does for me is um, because I bag my clippings um, just because I do not like thatch buildup. I don't like to track all these clippings, you know, into my house. So three boys running around, you know, they end up in the house. So <laughs> I like to keep it, you know, as clean as I can. And so I do bag my clippings, but mowing, you know, every two to three days, you know, those clippings are pretty fine, you know, pretty minimal. Um, those are dumped into an area or where I kind of let them compost and then I add those into our garden area, you know, in the spring. So I just come in and rototill all that in so I can kind of, you know, recycle some of that nutrient even though I'm not, you know, mulching it in the lawn. It's just, it provides a better look for me and again, you know, not having all those clippings in the house with the uh, unhappy wife. Yeah, understood. And, you know, I've really kind of um, taken that that uh, same approach really I'm, I'm instead of returning all my clippings to my lawn I'm just trying to keep that nutrient on my property uh, and, and you know composting those and adding them to the garden is a, is a great strategy like you know um, all season for the last eight months we've been doing the mulch versus bag study I'm really interested in those results um, although they're not as maybe astounding as I would have thought they would be mm -hmm. and so I don't know that we're actually losing a lot of nutrient by composting those but I think we are gaining that organic in the garden so you're talking about how you're um, bagging your clippings and one of the reasons is to keep your kids from tracking them in the house but also to minimize your thatch development. Uh, would you mind just showing us maybe what your thatch looks like here? Yeah, I haven't really looked at it this season but we'll go ahead and see, see what we got here. We'll use the, the, the old cup cutter. <laughs> Get a good look here of kind of where we're at. Wow, that looks great. Yeah, so not much thatch really at all. Um, obviously this is still a newer lawn, but um, you know, by by keeping those clippings down, I don't have uh, much much buildup of thatch. A little thatch is okay. I mean, I can have a little bit more than this, but mm -hmm. the more spongy it gets, you know, the more you kind of get that scalpy look. Um, you can see these channels here from uh, from yeah. earthworms, you know, so um, obviously you can do stuff to deter earthworms, but I prefer to, to have them here. Um, provides to aeration. Yeah, good aeration, these channels for roots to uh, to go and, um, you know, find air and, and water. Um, you can see some of the roots here in the, in the bottom, so that's about, you know, five inches. Um, great root growth coming into the winter and this looks like just a native soil that you planted right into yeah this is a native kind of silt loam soil that we have you know in our area so we have great soil here we don't really have any rocks you know mm -hmm. to speak of in this area so you know we do have a great foundation of, of soil so you can see our earth oh, yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh that no, looks great but yeah so pretty happy with uh, pretty happy with where we're at here <laughs> you gotta see that. You see that <laughs> you got That's a worm cool. there, a worm there, a worm there. So uh, we're doing good on our natural aeration. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> this can also cause problems for guys that are trying to mow uh, really low, you know, with the real mowers. So if you're getting down to, you know, a half an inch or so, these worm castings or mounds can cause problems. Um, but uh, that's why I like to stay above an inch so I can so get that. So even in an inch and a quarter, you don't really see much much problem with the worm castings? No, it can get a little bit bumpy, but as far as the, you know, the overall look of the lawn, um, it's, it's right about as low as you can go. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, I think it's great, Chris, that we got out of the lab and into the lawn, and I think it's important for people to know that we do that. You know, here I am in the lab collecting all this data and trying to help people drive their decisions, but we're actually kind of, you know, selfishly stealing that and using it for ourselves, too. Yeah, I mean, really, I want people to understand, you know, that our company, you know, we are a soil testing company um, with, you know, very advanced software. But, you know, the other side of it is, you know, we're not just doing that. We're actually living the life. We're doing this stuff. We're implementing, you know, our programs and, and following our guidance. So um, just letting people know that, 
you know, we do, we do live this life, you know, whether it's on the lawn or the garden, you know, we're always, um, you know, implementing our strategies and the strategies that we share with others, you know, in our own lives. And I think that's important, you know, for people to understand is, you know, not just being a lab and running an analysis, but the whole other side, you know, the lifestyle that goes along with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you are living it and that's that we've got the proof right here. So, well, I hope you enjoyed us getting out of the lab and into the lawn. If you enjoyed this and want to see how this lawn comes out of winter this coming spring, be sure to let us know in the comments below. We're wrapping up our field season here in the Pacific Northwest. And so the content you can expect will be more lab based work over the next several months. But we'll try to get out back out in the field just as soon as these soils start warming back up. Look forward to seeing you again. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you'd like.